Father, thank you for the day that you have given us. Thank you for the privilege of coming together to study from your word, to help us to be better disciples of yours. Father, we pray for those from our family and our friends who are in, in need of your care, your strength, and your healing. Father, you know the needs of each of those individuals, and our prayer is that you as the great physician, you as the great healer, you as the great comforter, you as the great strengthener will give everything to each individual that they need for those who are hurting, for their families, all of those individuals. Father, thank you for this time that we can come together to share with one another. Thank you, Father, for this church. Thank you for all of those who participate and who, who encourage and who lift uh, up others and who are willing to praise you. Just now be with us as we study from your word. May we use it to apply to our lives and help us to be better individuals. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of the people said, Amen. Amen. We're looking at a subject this morning that we usually do not, uh, usually don't want to really deal with that much. We're in John 11 this morning. If life is like a candle bright, death must be the wind. You can close your window right, but it still comes blowing in. Those are the lyrics that began Mo Bandy's song, Till I'm Too Old to Die Young. Death affects every one of us. Every person here this morning has been affected by death in some way or the other. There are family members that you will never know because death stole them away. There are loved ones you will never see again. There are futures that you will never be able to experience. If they haven't already, your mom and your dad will die. Your friends will die. Your children will die. You will die. We don't know in what order those things will happen. We have a progression that we feel that is most natural to us. But death doesn't always play by our rules, you see. Death doesn't care about your feelings. It doesn't care about your hopes. It doesn't care about your future. It doesn't care about your finances. It doesn't care how important you are. It doesn't care about your love. Death is the cruel, heartless enemy. And in reality, every single person, every single nation is a captive and a prisoner to death's chilling chains. Not a good way to start off a lesson, is it? <laughs> Who can free us? And that's what the story is about this morning. It's about Jesus. Jesus was affected by death. And we read the story of the death of one of his friends in John 11. In him was life, and the life was the light of the world. John tells us in John 1, 4. He's talking about Jesus there. And by giving sight to the blind man in John 11, which we talked about last week, I mean John 9, which we talked about last week, Jesus proved that he is the light of the world. Now it's time to prove that he is the resurrection and the life as he talks about in John eleven twenty five, A death has wounded him and affected him. His dear friend Lazarus has died. And it hurts Jesus. It hurts Mary and Martha, his sisters. Everyone knows, though, that Jesus could have saved him. 
if he had been there. He had done it before. He has healed people from their sickness. As ministers, we often scramble to see dying church members before they die. In the Lazarus story, Jesus takes pains to see Lazarus after he dies. Not only that, but Jesus fiddles around long enough to make sure that this corpse is plenty dead. He waits for four days before he goes to Bethany, where Lazarus is interred in a tomb. Mary and Martha, his sisters, are both reeling from the loss of their brother. As natural. Natural feeling. And they can't believe that Jesus didn't come. Why didn't he come? He didn't even help. They both believed that Jesus could have saved him, as we find later in the, in their, in their, as they interact with Jesus. Why did he not come? Why didn't he just speak a healing word? Why did Lazarus have to die? Why did death win again here? Because as we've seen, distance made no difference to Jesus as far as the miracles are concerned. He could have spoken. He knew that Lazarus was sick. Healing the sick is good. But Jesus goes from good to great when he raises the dead. And even today, for us, raising dead bodies when they're decaying is truly spectacular. Even when we read this story here that happened 2,000 years ago. Upon his arrival at the tomb, Jesus finds... Lazarus has already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany is less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews have come out to Bethany after hearing about the death of Lazarus to comfort Mary and Martha at the loss of their brother. When Martha hears that Jesus is coming, she goes out to meet him. But Mary stays back at the the house. Martha goes and meets him and she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But notice what she adds there to that. But I know even now God will give you whatever you ask. I don't know what she was thinking there. I don't know if she thought he would resurrect him or not. I don't think she did. But she knew something was going to happen because she knew that whatever Jesus asked, God was going to grant to him. Uh, grant to him. Jesus tells her, Martha, your brother's going to rise again. Once again, what we find here is Jesus is having a theological discussion with a woman which would have been very unusual in that time. Remember, he had that theological discussion with the woman at the well uh, 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 there. And so again, he's having that theological discussion. While that's not exactly what Jesus meant, she's not wrong because Martha says, Martha says, uh, after Jesus says, your brother will rise again, Martha responds, I know he will rise in the resurrection at the last day. The Jews believed in the resurrection. The Pharisees, the Sadducees did not believe in any resurrection. So Mary and Martha followed the teachings of the Pharisees here. And she knew that that Lazarus would rise again, but he would rise at the last day. But again, Jesus tells her, that's really really not what Jesus has in mind exactly here. Even though Jesus doesn't have that in mind, she's not entirely wrong. Jesus will raise Lazarus at the tomb. He'll raise him once in John 11. 
and he'll raise him again at the end of time, forever on the last day. Because Jesus was raised from the tomb, all who are in the tomb and all who have ever died and believing in him will be raised again too. So she was right. Lazarus will rise at the last day, in the last day. But in Jesus, we have life. In Jesus, sorrow is turned into joy. In Jesus, death loses and Jesus wins. Life wins. Life is eternal. Life wins both spiritually and physically here. Death cannot destroy spiritual life. Through Jesus, life is more powerful than death. And that's what the point that Jesus is wanting to make here. And Jesus said to her, after she says, I know that he will resurrect in the last days, Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe that? In verses 25 and 26 in chapter 11. If you remember it, when we started in the book of John, we talked about faith. Faith is not something you have. Faith is something you do. And earlier we, we talked about, in the book of John, there is no noun form of faith. No noun form of faith. It, in, in the Greek. That it does not occur. It is always in the verb form, doing something. If you read our English translation with faith as a verb here, here's how it would read. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who faiths in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by faithing in me will never die. Do you faith this? Again, the term faith in John is always a verb. It is translated sometimes believing and believe. Uh, but it is never a noun. It is always doing something. Yes, she replied literally. And literally it would be translated this, word, this way. I faith that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. I believe that you are the, the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Has Jesus done anything for Martha at this point? Has he resurrected Lazarus? He hasn't resurrected Lazarus. And yet, here is one of the great confessions of faith, not only in the book of John, but in the whole Bible. We find it here. Now, when we talk about and think about confessions of faith, we don't really think about Martha's here. We think about whose? We think about Peter's is the one we really think about when Peter makes that great confession. But Martha makes the confession here, even though Jesus hasn't done anything at this point, she knows from his history, his healings, and his signs that he is the Messiah, and she expresses that here. You are the Messiah. You are the Son of God. And then Martha leaves, and she goes to tell her sister, about Jesus coming. Tension always exists in our soul when a loved one dies. This is especially true when the individual is a 
who died as a Christian. We all know that better things await. We have hope. We have reason not to grieve like the rest of the world who has no hope, as Paul reminds us in 1 Thessalonians 4.13. Paul also writes, he says, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is far much better. Clearly, death produces something valuable and better for the Christian. And it is through this hope that we find comfort in our misery when death of a loved one occurs. We don't need to fear death or live in the dread of its cold grip. And that's what I think Paul was meaning when he said, what difference does it make if I live here or if I go on to be with Christ? I don't think he was saying, hey, okay, death, take me. That wasn't his thing. His point was, I'm not afraid to die. I don't dread death. What do you do with a man who doesn't dread death? How do you stop a man? Well, if you, don't, if you do that, I'm going to kill you. How do you stop that man? And he says, so what? If you kill me, it's better. And I think that's what it, we as Christians don't, shouldn't dread death. But that doesn't say, well, I'm ready to jump and die right now. I'm not ready to jump and die right now. But I don't think I would dread death. Because the scripture has promised me what will happen after death. The pain and the anger at the death of a loved one is still there. We know the good, but we feel the bad, and that's where the tension lies when there's a Christian. We know the good, but we know what our feelings are at this point in time. For us and in the scripture, hope and misery walk hand in hand. They always do when there's the death of the Christian. My heart ached when I lost family members. And yet, at the same point, I didn't grieve as those who had no hope. I still am human. So I feel that misery. But I feel it with hope. So there are you having Misery and hope walking together, hand in hand, during the death of a Christian. It's hard to be positive about death because we know that death is an attack on a God-given life. Death is a terrible, dreadful enemy. The majority of scriptures does not paint death in any sort of positive way. God, God says, I take no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies in Ezekiel 18.32. Death only entered the world, how? By sin. There was no death before sin. Because Jesus defeated sin on the cross, the life necessarily wins again. Sin is the lifeblood of death. When sin is removed, death dies and life wins. Jesus' death was a victory over sin and every death is a reminder of the sinful, painful, fallen world. But we have hope for something better. And that's what, helps, that's what 
we cling to and we hold to as Christians, the hope of something better. For us and in the scripture, the death of sin and the victory of life again walk hand in hand. Sin will ultimately die and there will be the victory of life finally, ultimately. But now they walk hand in hand. There is the hope and there is the sin and death. Paul calls death an enemy that is doomed for destruction. In 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, verse 26, he says, the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. At the final resurrection, when our bodies are raised to eternal glory, we will fully appreciate the saying, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death. Where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? When a weakened army was defeated and captured, the ensuing celebration, they celebrated, and then what happened was they began taunting and they began ridiculing the the army. Paul here pictures us At the final resurrection, when death is defeated, he pictures the Christian taunting death. Where is your victory now, death? Where is your sting, death? Because it has been defeated. And Paul uses that and shows that as the Christian taunting death at this point. Death was not a part of God's original plan and it is not a part of his eternal plan. When God created the Garden of Eden and set it there, he didn't say everyone's going to die. That wasn't his plan. The grand blessing of Scripture is not that we get to die and go and be with God. That's not the grand blessing. But the grand blessing is that death is destroyed forever. Forever. There will be no death. We get to live and be with God forever as children of God. Death loses and life wins. Death itself will be cast into the lake of fire with all of God's enemies. We find it in Revelation 20, 14. Death dies and goes to hell. And strangely enough, in some way, there can still be glory in death. The glory of God, that's what the raising of Lazarus here is all about in chapter 11. Lazarus' sickness was for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified by it, John eleven four 4 tells us. So when Jesus tells them to open the tomb and Mary protests, she says, no, don't open the tomb, you will begin... He will begin to smell. He's been in there for four days. When they open the tomb, Jesus responds, Did I not say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God in verse 40? In verse 4, it talks about glory. In verse 40, it talks about glory. The resurrection of Lazarus is bookended by glory in verse 4 and verse 40. His sickness, death, and resurrection are all illustrating the glory of God here. Interesting, in John, the word glory is often associated with death. When speaking about his own death, Jesus says the hour has come for the Son of God 
uh, Son of Man to be glorified, John 12, 23. When telling Peter about his future death by crucifixion, the text tells us, now this he said signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God in John 21, 19. Now that's, to me, that is such a strange connection, death and glory. When I think of death, I usually do not think of glory. It's a terrible invasion of God's creation, death is. There are, however, as the scripture points out, a few ways that death does produce glory. When a martyr dies faithfully to the cause of Christ, who does it glorify? glorifies God. Jesus through suffering and death was crowned with glory and honor Hebrews 2.9 tells us. When we follow him to the cross it is a glorious thing and he, he brings many sons to glory in Hebrews 2.10 tells us. So there are even instances where death can bring glory. <clears throat> we find in other points of scripture that suffering with Christ is pictured as a glorious moment. It is not to be despised, but it is to be celebrated. Matthew 5, 11 and 12, and Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount talks about those who are persecuted. Acts 5.41, the disciples said they counted it as a blessing that they were worthy to suffer for Christ. Philippians 1.29, Philippians 3.10, 1 Peter 4.12-16, all show that suffering with Christ is pictured as a glorious moment. I hope that if I ever have to suffer in that way, that I bring glory to God. The way we handle our sufferings can bring glory to God. I've seen it and you've seen it the way people handle their sufferings. There are those who can handle it with a great attitude and I think when they, are, they, they do that and they're Christians, they bring glory to God. And there are those who have it, they fight, they complain, does that not mean that it hurt, doesn't hurt? Oh, yeah, it hurts. But what is our attitude towards that? What, how do we handle that? I think, again, we either we're going to bring glory or we probably can do the opposite. Death ultimately is the end game of carrying the cross. It's the finish line. The glory seen in the death of Lazarus is not in the fact that he was sick and died and his body began to decay. The glory is what happened after that. Death didn't win. Life did win when Jesus resurrected him. Lazarus was raised to life and death. Uh, he was raised to life and death became a failure. Death was plundered by the power of Jesus and that was the glorious thing there. Even more glory is seen in the resurrection of Jesus, which we will deal with later in the book of John uh, here. 
But what happened with Jesus, Jesus died and rather than coming back to his old life, he pushed all the way through death and he experienced all that death could accomplish and he walked away from it more powerful than ever. Jesus will never die again. Lazarus was resurrected here, but Lazarus will die again. He did die again. But with Jesus, his resurrection, he, re he came all the way through. He will never die again. And the great thing about it, he's always carrying around his victory. And he's always saying, Danny, do you want a part of this victory? He's always saying to you, Danny or Bill, do you want a part of this victory that I'm carrying with me? While death does not, is not the end and death does not win, it still hurts. It doesn't mean that we should accept death as natural or somehow God's will. I think death is an affront to God's will. It's the destination where sin leads us, and I think that's why Jesus wept in John eleven thirty five. 35 there. The scripture tells us Jesus wept at his friend's death. As little as John writes about Jesus' humanity, there are a few moments when we see genuine human emotions, and John eleven thirty five 35 is one of those moments. Now, when I was growing up and I had to learn a scripture verse, you know, the verse I always wanted to go to and learn? John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. <laughs> I could remember that. Uh, but we don't realize the importance of those two words there. John, again, gives us a glimpse into Jesus' human emotions. John mostly deals with Jesus as the Son of God, the Messiah, but here we get a glimpse of his human emotions. He, he wept for his friend, and he probably wept for other reasons there also. Uh, that, that's that. The resurrection of Lazarus it's the greatest of all signs that we have seen so far in the book of John. Jesus can heal the sick, but here he resurrects the dead. But it is not the greatest that we will see in John. And we will look at the greatest later on in the book of John, which is the resurrection of Jesus. John 11 is a good story, a great story. You wish at the end of, the, of chapter 11, that was the end of it, of that story, but that's not the end of the story in chapter, in, uh, uh, of Lazarus. John gives us a great insight, a little addition to this story of the resurrection of Lazarus in John 12. The first few verses there. And in John 12, what we find is after Jesus has raised Lazarus from the dead, they basically had a party where Jesus was being honored and Lazarus was being honored. And what you find is <clears throat> people come not only to see Jesus, but people come to see Lazarus. There may have been two lines, I don't know. My imagination is as good as anybody else's. But one line for Jesus and one line for Lazarus. People were coming to see Jesus, talk to him, but a lot of people were coming to see Lazarus. If you were at that party, which line would you be in first? Who would you want to talk to first? I'd want to talk to Lazarus first. You can go talk to Jesus first, but I'd want to talk to Lazarus first. Not very often do you get to talk to an expert in death, and he would have been an expert in death. What's it like? Did you see a bright light? 
do Wednesday nights count? Do Wednesday night attendance count? Or do they not? I would have wanted to talk to Lazarus there. I would have had a lot of questions to ask him. I would have wanted to talk to Jesus too. But first of all, I would want to talk to that expert in death because I knew at that point one day I'd be facing it too. Next thing is the chief priests start planning to return Lazarus to the tomb where he came from. They plot to kill Lazarus. Why? Because of many, because of Lazarus, uh, many of the Jews were coming over to see Jesus and they were believing in him. But do you see what's wrong with this strategy of the Jewish religious leaders? They plot to kill uh, 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 Lazarus. Jesus has just raised Lazarus from the dead, and they're thinking about returning into the tomb. Kill Lazarus, raise Lazarus. Kill Lazarus, raise Lazarus. It's not only silly, but it shows in John that unbelief often has a nasty moral component as well. They see that Lazarus was raised, but they're still blind to the sign that it proves that Jesus is truly the Messiah. They look at all of the evidence. What evidence? The resurrection of Lazarus is pretty good evidence. They knew that he could heal. Jesus could heal. Uh, Also, uh, they, they look at all of the evidence. How much evidence is needed to convince these folks that Jesus is the Messiah? there will never be enough evidence to convince some folks to follow Jesus. And we have to live with that and realize that and back off and move on and shake the dust off of our feet and move on to someone else. There was never enough evidence to convince the Pharisees, the religious leader, that Jesus is the Messiah. But the good thing about it is in the book of John, John doesn't write primarily the story. Apparently, it's not about these obstinate unbelievers. That's not the question. They will never change. There will never be enough evidence for them. The question is, are those of us who say we are believers in Jesus willing to believe it in the tough times and in the good moments when we often forget Jesus? Are those of us who are believers in Jesus willing to believe in him during the tough moments as well as the good moments in life? Because our tendency sometimes is to forget him in those moments. That's why John writes, as we find in the early, in the, at the end of his book, he writes to convince us that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the resurrection and the life. He is the one that brings to us eternal life. He is the one who gives us hope even in the midst of death. Do you have any comments? Sometimes I feel like it was uh, preaching, they're looking at a funeral sermon when we deal with death. But all of us, all of us will have to face death at one time or another. It has affected every one of us. And how do we respond to it? Daddy, I've always wondered whether Lazarus was happy to come back or not. Where had he been those four months? What? I was always wondering whether Lazarus was happy to come back or was he sad to come back. That would have been a great question to ask him, wouldn't it? That's why you need to talk to him. (laughs) (laughs) Say, where have you been those four days? Yeah, yeah, where, where, yeah, been a great question to ask him. Because we think we 
you know, you look at the Bible and there are those who think they have all of the answers where the, what happens this and what happens that, but yet there are others who look at it and say different. But Lazarus would have been the expert. You're right. Where have you been? What's, hap what's happened in the last few days? Good question. Great question. <laughs> All right. That was not the same Lazarus as Lazarus and the rich man. The story of Lazarus and, and the rich man, man. Mm -hmm. was not the same one. Okay. Right. You need to go and speak up, Arthur, for me. My my hearing is almost as bad as my eyesight. <laughs> the difference between the Old Testament view and the New Testament view. Yes. But it would have been an interesting question to ask him, though, wouldn't it? We'd have to do that. Went 40 days where? After the resurrection? No. Uh, he stayed here until the disciple Thomas had to see the blood with his pierced side. And so Jesus was here for 40 something days around 40, and I thought when he, he went off, when Christ went, died, he laughed, he died on the cross, and some didn't believe that there was some baby in there, even in uh, Acts, the second tells about the, the ones that had done wrong went when Jesus left and did go there. Talk about Jesus going into in the book of Acts talk about in the Sheol or into the grave and talking to those who, were, who had passed on. Thank you, Father, for the day again. Thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus. Thank you for this demonstration of your power over death. Thank you for the demonstration of your power over death and your own resurrection and the hope that it gives to us. Now, Father, be with us as we come together to worship you as the great God, the creator, the sustainer of life. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, and amen.
services this morning, especially our visitors. We appreciate you coming to worship. Mike uh, is trying to get John's attention. But we do appreciate everyone coming out for services this morning. We want to make sure everyone feels welcome. Be sure and pick up a Kingston Weekly and uh, check out all of the announcements that are there. I won't repeat any of those. Make notice of all of the of our sick who are on the back, must be sure and reach out to them, pray for them uh, each day of this week. Mike uh, just just sharing an announcement that I want to make about June the 15th on our summer series at Lakeview Center. He's planning a barbecue uh, dinner that evening at 5.30 when Jeff Brown will be here to speak. I guess Jeff needs to be fed before he speaks. <laughs> So, my, so Mike's planning barbecue, potato salad, baked beans, and he'll have a sign-up sheet next Sunday. Also, tonight's Bible study at Lakeview Center will be lucky to have Bill Scott teaching tonight. So he just wants everybody to come. We're hoping for about 75 to be there tonight. He always has the most in attendance when he teaches. So be sure and come out for Bible study. It's always a good time to be together. Is there any other announcements before we begin our service? Let's have a great service this morning. Let's have a prayer. Father, we're thankful that we can come together in safety this morning to worship you. It's truly a privilege when we can come together and sing and bow our heads in prayer, open the Bible so you can talk to us. Father, we're thankful that you love us. We're thankful for Jesus. Be with us as we worship. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Morning, church. Number 15, if you used your book, number 15. Oh, God, you are my God, and I...
Number 34. This will be the song before I read it in prayer. Is that right? No. Okay. I need to change that on my sheet. Number 34. Praise the Lord, O heavens, our Lord. morning is from Mark verses 43 through 45. Not so with you instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be the first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Let us pray. Lord God, our Father in heaven, we thank you for the blessings that you've given us in the sunshine today. And we thank you for the gathering of your people here to raise our voice in song and in prayer to you, that we might remember the heart that we have.
have within ourselves that we might look to you to share and be one all together. This we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Song for communion today is number 315. When I survey the wondrous cross. service to give remembrance and celebrate the life of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. About a month ago I was privileged to go to an Elton John concert and it amazed me how many people were there that were celebrating John Elton's music career and there was loud applause throughout for his achievement in life. He gave us songs. He did not give a lifestyle that I would recommend, but he gave us songs that we all probably enjoyed sometime in our life. For the last two or three days, if you've watched television at all, we've witnessed the 70th anniversary of Queen Elizabeth of England. She gave 70 years of her life to the subjects of Britain, and they were honoring her. They honored her with parades. They honored her with cheers because she was beloved by them. We have this chance, I think, to honor somebody that gave us far more by far more of those than any of those people. He gave us the salvation if we ask for it and we do what his, he's asked of us. This is why we're going to be taken to the bread 
to celebrate in remembrance. We're going to take the bread in remembrance of his life. We go back to this word and we can read of what all he did for the people back then, the miracles, the writings that he gave us. Let us take the bread and think back on that for just a little bit. Would you bow with me? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Dear Lord, we so humbly come before you this, this time to remember the things that you have done for us, to remember that the life that you were on earth here and all that you've done in that. Let us have remembrance of that, dear Lord, at this time as we partake of the bread. Now we come to the other part, the celebration. And it is a celebration. The fruit of the vine represents his blood that he shed for us for the remission of our sins. I don't think we ought to necessarily jump up and clap for that or shout and holler, but it far more deserves clapping and honoring him through hip hip hooray for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You gave us more than any other human being on this earth. Let us celebrate that when we partake of the fruit of the vine, his blood that he shed for us. Bow with me. Our Father, we come before you again to, to give you thanks for your son the sacrifice that he did for us for the remission of our sins. Dear Lord, we're so thankful for that. We're also thankful, dear Lord, that with, with the power that you gave to raise him up from the dead in three days, we're thankful for all those things, dear Lord, as we partake of the fruit of the vine. We give thanks and celebrate that time in Christ's name. step this time to my right left your right we'll dismiss the children for children's church if I, please stand this will be the song before the lesson
5 o'clock at the Lakeview Center. We've been doing uh, a great study on uh, grace, and it's just a wonderful time to get together. And if you have not been a part of that yet, I want to encourage you to be a part of that Bible study. It is uh, it's a great study, great time together. But also, I want to encourage those of you who, uh, all of our congregation, to take part in our summer series. Uh, this has been a wonderful uh, summer series so far, and I expect it to continue to be that way. We've had some great speakers on some great topics, and this coming week, uh, we have Larry Klein from Hardin Valley will be speaking to us, as well as many others lined up, so if you have not been there yet, you don't know what you're missing. Uh, it's a great time, great fellowship, and as was mentioned, uh, coming up in about two weeks, we have food, so that's always good, right? We always love the food, so uh, be, be putting on your calendar, making plans to be a part of that and supporting uh, that effort this week. I know you won't... Uh, won't be sad you were part of it. Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 20. We're going to be looking at the, that passage for most of the lesson this morning. But I want to paint a picture for you as we get started. I want you to think of this uh, distant figure on this road. And the road is leading up to Jerusalem. Now Jerusalem sits up on a hill, and so this road to Jerusalem is a, is a long road leading up to this city on the hill. And we see a, a solitary figure walking along this road. But he's walking purposefully. His, his face is set. He's boldly and without fear, he's marching towards the city of Jerusalem. He knows where he's going. He knows what he's going to do. Uh, he, is, he is set on his direction. When you look into the face of this man, he is a man that is on a mission. You ever see a man or a woman on a mission? They get that, that look, they know what they're going to do, and you can't, you can't deter it. You ever seen a kid or a child who's on a mission? You cannot deter that child, can you? They're on a mission. But here is a man, Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, and he's walking towards the city on the hill, Jerusalem. But is he alone? Is he alone? I mean, where are his disciples? Have they forsaken him already? No, not in this time. They're there. Maybe they're falling a, a little bit of a distance behind them because they're, they're weary. They're not sure what's going on. Keep in mind, Jesus has just shared with them, if you look in the, uh, the first part of the Above what we're going to be reading today in chapter 20, Jesus has told them, look, I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to be turned over. Uh, the, my mission is about done. And, and so they're, they're weary. They're not quite sure. But Jesus, in contrast, is completely sure. What a contrast between Jesus and his followers. They're skittish. They're not quite sure what's going on. And yet here's Jesus walking. His followers, however, are fearful and they're bewildered. They catch up. He begins to tell them what's going to happen. In Mark 10, verse 33 and 34, we see the same account. He says this, he says, seeing, you're going up, seeing we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after these, he will arise. Now what's interesting about this is so far, his followers, they've come to a point along Jesus' journey at this point. They've been with him three years. And they've come to the point where they, they're even saying, no, we believe, we're following because we believe you're the Messiah. We believe you're the one who is the king that's been promised. But the message he's given them now is, is confusing them. It's, it's not a new message. He's talked of it twice before, but never so forthrightly. You'd think that they would focus their attention on Jesus now as he's sharing this. You'd think that they'd be really wanting to know, well, well what's, what's coming next? What are we to do? You'd think they'd focus their attention on Jesus, on what he was going to suffer 
and endure as he's been telling them this. But we'd be wrong. These are mere men. They're like us. They're a little selfish. Uh, they, they think about themselves, so instead their thoughts turn to ambition. Their thoughts turn to power and greatness and honor. They've been with Jesus for over three years now and had not learned the most basic principle of the kingdom. And Matthew recounts that and what and what happened after the announcement of Jesus. Matthew 20, verse 20 through 28 is what we're going to look at this morning. If you have your Bibles or read with me on the screen. He says, Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with their sons. And kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, What do you want? She said to him, Say that these two sons of mine, are to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. Jesus answered, You do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? They said to him, We are able. He said to them, You will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and my left hand is not mine to grant, but it is for those to whom it has been prepared by my Father. And when the ten heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, I want to think about this story for a moment, because it's real easy for us to read that, and, and especially that first part where we see that, that this mother was coming to make a request for her sons. Before Salome, Salome uh, was the name of this mother. And we can be a little hard on her and say, well, how could she ask something of Jesus like that? How selfish of her? How, how could she go up before Jesus and all these other 12 apostles, disciples, and ask this question just trying to self-promote? Well, let's not be too hard. She was a good woman. Salome was a woman. She was a disciple herself. She had been following Jesus. She was a follower of Christ. She had confidence uh, in, in Jesus. And she believed in him as the king and that he had this kingdom that was coming. She believed. So she reasoned. If, if Jesus is going to be this great king, couldn't he do as he pleased? Well, sure he could. Couldn't he appoint his favorites to positions of power and influence? This mother is not unlike many of us uh, mothers and fathers in this audience. We want to see the best for our children. And she was a concerned mother. And so it was a really natural thing for her to ask this question. And, and the, when you read the scriptures, Mark 15, 40, and Matthew 27, 56, and John 19, 25, there's good evidence that this was Mary, Jesus' mother's sister. So this makes this a family affair. Maybe she's thinking, well, let, let's, keep the, let's keep it in the family. I mean, I'm only asking that, that he puts his first cousins as his left and right, because after all, what is it about blood? <laughs> blood is thicker than water. So I don't falter. I don't think we can really falter for that. So what was wrong with this? Notice Jesus doesn't deny that there will be positions of honor in the kingdom. He doesn't deny that at all. But they will not be obtained the same way that Salome thinks. And here again is our lesson that we have to learn over and over again. Jesus 
have different mindsets and different way of thinking than we do. Jesus is constantly taught that the least shall be the greatest. The last will be first, and the first will be last. That service, service is the way to advance. So how will Jesus answer such a bold request that a mother makes to put her sons at the left and right hand of Jesus? Well, I love the way he handles this, because rather than reply directly to the mother, who does he turn to? He turns to James and John. He turns to the grown men that are letting their mother speak for them. And it's obvious that they want the positions. So Jesus answers that we saw in, in 22 and 23. He says, you don't know what you're asking here. You don't know what you're, you're asking about. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm to drink? They said, well, we're, we're able. He said, you will drink my cup. But then he says, but to sit in my right hand and my left hand are not mine to grant, but it's for those who are, who are willing, those who have been prepared by my Father. See, we remember his greatness. Anybody who has greatness, it carries a price, doesn't it? You don't come great just from sitting there doing nothing. Greatness comes at a price, and greatness extracts a price. When you think of great people within our culture and history, Mozart, Shakespeare, Lincoln, on and on, you can think of these. These honors weren't just placed on them. They weren't just given to them. I mean, even their dearest friends could not just give that to them. So what Jesus says in verse 23, you will drink of my cup, but my, the left and right is not mine to grant. Jesus doesn't rebuke that their desire for greatness. He's not saying that at all. He just points out the price. You want to be great, here's the price. The question is, are you able to do that? Can you make the sacrifice it takes? Can you endure the hardship? Today, there are many within our within our culture, within our society, within our churches. Many cry out for greatness, but there are very few who are aware of the cost that is involved in being great. Many clamor for the prize, but few are willing to pay the price. See, the road to greatness is not traveled in an air-conditioned Tesla, okay? That, that's not it. It's not going down this air-conditioned Tesla down this, this lonely highway. You know what it's more like? It's more like the rock climber who's climbing up a, a steep mountain, who's clinging to every, every hand, handle he can get on those rocks, who's scraping his arms and his elbows as he clings tightly to the surface of that rock as he climbs, exhausted and tired. And when he overcomes that, when he gets to the top and he works through that, then he can look at the greatness. But that's what it's like as the wind is blowing and it's hard against him trying to knock him off that rock face. He gets to the top. He understands the price. The road will take its price. What Jesus wants his followers to know is that he wants you to know it, it takes a price. The road will take its price. And, and he, he makes no um, excuses about that. He doesn't hide that fact. As a matter of fact, he says, there is a price that you will have to pay if you want to be great in my kingdom. See, we, mankind, are, are not always like what Jesus says. But he doesn't try to deceive us. Verse 25, but Jesus called them to him and said, you know what the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It should not be so among you, but whoever be great among you must be your servant. See, the disciples, they couldn't imagine this kingdom without thinking of an earthly kingdom. 
They, they kept thinking about this earthly kingdom. Many today still make that same mistake. They're looking for this earthly kingdom. And Jesus kept saying over again, it's not about the earthly kingdom. It's, it's not about that. Uh, they, they were thinking of this earthly kingdom with, with this hierarchy of power. All they had to reference was what they knew. And what they knew was this hierarchy of power with rank and its privileges. Great men exercising authority over them. That's what they knew. That rulers, real rulers of greatness should lord over their subjects. And to be honest, that's really what these men were wanting. They wanted to rule over those who had conquered them. They, they didn't like the Romans. They thought, hey, Jesus is going to make this kingdom, put me on left and right so we can rule over those who have been ruling over us and we can be that great kingdom again. They wanted that. But let's not be too hard on them either. Because the question is, are we any different? Are we any different if we honestly ask ourselves, is there never political maneuvering that we do in the church? Remember, uh, did uh, Dio Trifius in 3 John 9, he liked to put himself first? We can do that too. Sometimes he takes the shape of a preacher. Sometimes the devil uses it in the shape of an elder or a deacon. And sometimes he wears your clothes. Thankfully, it doesn't take long for most of us to be brought down to size when we try to do that. So what's wrong with this? What's wrong with what's going on? The thirst for prominence and power nullifies our Christian life. That's the problem. It nullifies Christian usefulness and, and the spiritual power that Christ wants to give. Political standards, materialistic measures, they have no place in spiritual endeavors. And that's what Jesus is trying to get his disciples to see. You're thinking, you're thinking materialistically, you're thinking uh, earthly, you're thinking power. And Jesus said, it shall not be so among you. That's not what I'm about. And, I, and I'm trying to show you that it's about serving. It's about putting yourself last. It shall not be among you. So what's the true nature of greatness? What is that true nature of greatness? It doesn't depend on, doesn't depend on our appointment. It doesn't depend on our intellect, how many degrees or, or what colleges we went to. It doesn't depend upon ability to acquire money. See, in the kingdom of God, every man has an equal shot of greatness. And that's that's great news. It's like the one talent man or the five talent man. There it is. Greatness can be achieved by anyone who is willing to serve. God has purposed greatness for those who fit themselves for it. One problem we have is that we're so finicky. We won't serve except for the highest office. If I can't be an elder, then count me out. If, if I can't uh, start teaching Bible class, count me out. If I can't have this, count me out. We've often not learned the first thing about service then. It's not about the position. We think about <clears throat> different things like presidents. Presidents, what happens to them as great servants of the public? Well, so many times you see the presidents resign and where they go. But you see people like John Quincy Adams in history. Here's the sixth president of the United States. After he served as president, what did he do? He went back to the House of Representatives from 1831 to 1848 and continued to serve the public because he didn't think that it was just, I've, I've, I've reached my point. I can just stop serving. He actually died at work. He was more concerned about service than he was the position that he held. Boy, don't we wish we had some of those folks back today. Isn't that amazing? Service is the only true ticket to truly being great. See, one of these days, all of us will be judged according to the deeds done in the body of Christ. Some have no fear 
because of their orthodox views. Some have no fear because of their soundness in their faith. They've refused to compromise in even the smallest point of doctrine. They will base their defense on such things as, well, I was baptized and immersed for the mission of my sins. Hey, I observed the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. I gave at least 10% of my income to the church. I attended Bible classes, morning worship, Bible studies in the afternoon and on Wednesday night. I didn't, I didn't smoke, I didn't chew, I didn't drink, I didn't dance, I didn't use drugs or profanity. I was involved in the work of the local church and even taught a Bible class. I always worshipped without the use of instruments. I was zealous in teaching my denominational friends. I always said my prayers before each meal and again when I retired at night. I always tried to be a good person. Those all are great, guys. Those are all great things. But some of us are going to be surprised, however, when the Lord asks us another set of questions. When the Lord asks us, why didn't you feed me when I was hungry? Why didn't you give me drink when I was thirsty? Why didn't you take care of me when you saw that I was a stranger? Why didn't you clothe me when you saw that I was naked? Why didn't you visit me when I was sick? Why didn't you come to see me when I was in prison? Are we prepared to answer this set of questions? me that's the most important see Matthew chapter 25 verse 31 through 46 says exactly what I just said when the son of man comes in his glory and all the angels with him then he will sit on his glorious throne before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats He'll place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Then he'll say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he'll answer them saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. God will judge us according to our reaction to human need. The simple things, giving a hungry man a meal, a thirsty man a drink, welcoming a stranger, cheering up the sick, visiting the prisons, things anyone can do. If you want to delight a parent, what do you do? You do something for the child. Enough said. We shouldn't be proud of the fact that this become, that we have become a me generation. That books about how to be better for me, forgetting others, looking out for number one, that, that me generation, this is just the opposite of what Jesus did and wants us to do. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. 
Can you see it? Can we as a church see that, that Jesus is serving? Uh, can we see him serving in the carpentry shop when he was growing up? Seeing Jesus touching the eyes of a blind man? Jesus making the lame to walk? Jesus uh, preaching good news to the poor? Jesus sticking up for the woman caught in adultery? Jesus making the, the lepers clean? Jesus walking among the outcasts, the Samaritans, the publicans, the sinners. And what's he doing? He's offering his friendship. And then Jesus kneeling and washing the feet of his disciples. It all becomes so clear that Jesus, he came to serve. And now we come to the final act. Jesus walking towards that, that road to Jerusalem. That city on a hill where he is going to give the ultimate price. He is going to give his ultimate service to us. And as he's walking, Jesus is still thinking service. He would take the jeers. He would take the stripes. He would take the beatings and the crown of thorns. He'll take the spit, the shame. He'll take all that, and he'll even take the death by crucifixion because he gave his life a ransom for many. He came to serve. Even in glory, he is still thinking of us today. He's thinking of us in an eye of service. He is our high priest he is making intercession for us. He is our pattern, and his pattern shouts, service, service, service. Brothers and sisters, if we want to be close to God, if we want to be great in his kingdom, then we have to serve. We have to be people who get off of our high horse, who get away from, from this me self-image and looking for serving ourselves and, and looking to church to give me serve God with our lives and our hearts, but we want to roll 
these are hard announcements to always have to make, but one of the things that Rachel and I have prayed about over the last couple weeks was uh, an opportunity to serve another congregation that has uh, talked with me, and we have prayed a lot about this, and um, we have decided that is probably the best fit for us right now with our family, and, uh, and so at the end of July, I'll be stepping down and resigning from the pulpit here to go to the Lomax Church of Christ in Holmwall, Tennessee, and uh, be the senior minister there, and just want the congregation here to know that I love you very much, and I'm so thankful that I've had the opportunity to serve here and to be the minister here and to, to share with you some, through some really tough times. You know, when, when I first got here, I closed the church down after two weeks, and y'all stayed with me. So, I, you know, just, just with COVID hitting and being able to, to go through all that and to become close to so many of you, uh, we want you to know, our family wants you to know how much we love you. This is the first church that I've been the full-time pulpit minister for. And the, the, the training that I've gotten here and the, the acceptance uh, is always going to be remembered and, and be very dear to us. And so we love you all very much and want you to know this was not an easy decision to make. Uh, but again, uh, one, you know, our daughter will be about an hour and a half away, so we'll get to watch her play volleyball more often. Uh, but also just the, the congregation, the work there, it's a smaller community. Uh, I think God has really uh, opened some doors for us to, to do some great things for them and to continue to spread his word. My prayers are going to be with you in this congregation. I'm not leaving yet. I've got two months. So uh, I look forward to, to those two months being with you and getting to spend some time with you before we, dep we depart from here to move that way. But I just want you to know how much we love you and appreciate you. Thank you. John, you've done something I never was able to do. You've closed the church down for two weeks. I've run a lot of people off from the church uh, before, but uh, not closed it down completely. I do want to say we hate to see you go, uh, you and your family, but we do wish you the very best uh, in your move. Uh, I must say we thank you for your service here. Uh, you begin... Uh, as I understand it, I wouldn't hear the streaming ministry here. It has greatly expanded, and uh, we appreciate that very much. Appreciate your service. And our God's grace and God's blessings, we wish upon you and your family uh, in this move. Uh, we Again, thank you for your service. Now Sean's going to come and close us out. I'll tell you what, these two guys, as I understand it, really helped this church and pulled this church together during COVID. Uh, so thanks to both of you. Where are you? Remember, I'm a one-eyed guy. I'm moving to Italy in July, so. <laughs> couple announcements, uh, dates. Golden Gophers are going to uh, rugby to the bed and breakfast to eat on Thursday, June 16th. Please let Miss Betty know if you want to go. VBS is going to be July 30th, um, a Saturday. Uh, more details will follow. We need plenty of volunteers, teachers, everything. So um, please see Miss Della or Michael, correct? Then... There has been a crock pot up here since Miss Moore passed away, so it's still on the front. I don't know who it belongs to, so please, if it's yours, grab it. Anything else that I've missed? Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, just uh, thank you for this wonderful day that you have given us. Just thank you for this uh, church family, this life that you have blessed on us. Lord, we ask you to be with us as we walk out these doors and have us reach out and touch people's lives and have us live like you want us to live by touching everybody and being disciples. Be with us and 
until we meet again in Christ's name. Amen. Italy bound. Yeah.